on World News Tonight. Save Democracy. India's Congress lawmakers wear black to protest Rahul Gandhi's dismissal. New reports. China issues report on U.S. human rights violations in 2022. Has the U.S. been undermining basic human rights? Find out tonight. Nuclear tensions. North Korean leader says regime should perfectly be prepared to use nuclear weapons anytime, anywhere. And exploring the skies, Valentin Deluc takes flight at legendary Hot Air Balloon Festival. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you're joining us on World News. Now there is an update on the political front as lawmakers belonging to India's main opposition Congress party wore black outfits, held placards that said save democracy and threw paper in parliament in protest against the disqualification of their leader Rahul Gandhi from the chambers. Gandhi lost his parliament seat on Friday, a day after a court in the western state of Gujarat convicted him and sentenced him to two years in jail for a defamatory comment he made during an election campaign rally in 2019. Gandhi is out on bail and his lawyers are expected to challenge the verdict in a higher court this week. Gandhi told reporters on Saturday that he was disqualified from parliament for questioning Prime Minister Narendra Modi about his relationship with Gautam Adani, founder of the Adani Group business conglomerate. Gandhi and other opposition leaders say the Prime Minister's long-standing ties with Gautam Adani helped the business group secure investments from state-run firms and win big-ticket contracts such as the management of six airports. Both the government and the Adani group have denied the accusations. Opposition lawmakers have been vocal about their demand for a joint parliamentary committee inquiry into Adani's finances, forcing the speaker to repeatedly adjourn proceedings of parliament. A senior federal minister said Congress lawmakers were insulting parliament by not allowing it to function. Now, China's State Council Information Office issued the report on human rights violations in the United States in 2022. In the United States, a country labeling itself a human rights defender, chronic diseases such as money politics, racial discrimination, gun and police violence, as well as wealth polarization are rampant. The report further said that human rights legislation and justice have seen an extreme retrogression, further undermining the basic rights and freedoms of the American people. The report pointed out that the U.S. is a country defined by extreme violence and the people are threatened by violent crime and violent law enforcement and the personal safety of citizens cannot be guaranteed. Prisons are overcrowded and have become modern slavery facilities where forced labor and sexual exploitation are commonplace. The report highlighted the growing racism in the U.S. and the widespread discrimination against minorities. Life expectancy has fallen sharply while drug abuse deaths have continued to rise. The environment in which children live is worrisome. Under the interaction of the polarized economic distribution pattern, the social pattern of racial conflict and the political pattern controlled by capital interest groups, the U.S. has further fallen into the quagmire of institutional failure, lack of governance, ethnic division and social unrest in recent years. The report said that the U.S. politicians serving the interests of the oligarchy had not only gradually lost the subjective will and the objective ability to respond to the basic demands of ordinary people and defend the basic rights of ordinary citizens, thus unable to solve their own structural and persistent problems problems of human rights problems, but have also arbitrarily used human rights as weapons to attack other countries, creating confrontation, division and chaos in the international community and have become a troublemaker and obstacle to global human rights progress. Now, the World Bank projects that average global economic growth could slump to its lowest figure in three decades, unless there's a turning point in taming inflation, reducing debt and cutting carbon emissions. After three decades of mostly steady-paced growth, global economic growth is now hitting a speed limit. The average potential growth in GDP was at 3.5% in the decade between 2000 and 2010, but had dropped to 2.6% in the next decade between 2011 and 2021. On Wednesday, the World Bank released a new report that warns of global GDP growth shrinking to 2.2% annually between now and 2030. The report also stated that failure to reverse the expected slowdown in potential GDP growth could reverse decades of efforts to tackle climate change and reduce poverty. Though policies that incentivize work, increase productivity and accelerate investment could reverse the trend, World Bank chief economist Indermit Gill says a lost decade could be in the making for the global economy. 
According to the report, what's halting nearly three decades of sustained economic growth is the overlapping crises of the past few years, including the COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Experts say that in order to change the trajectory, policymakers need to prioritize taming inflation, ensuring financial sector stability, and reducing debt. Also, promoting climate-friendly investments could add a 0.3 percentage point to annual potential growth. Over in Afghanistan, a growing number of Afghan girls and women are going online as a last resort to get around the Taliban's restrictions on higher education. But even there, they must grapple with cripplingly slow internet speeds and power cuts if they can afford a computer at all. In her Kabul home, Sophia logs on to an online English class. You get awareness. The Taliban government has barred female students from high schools and universities, but it hasn't banned the internet. In fact, Taliban officials are regulars on social media. But Sophia's classmates distort and the picture freezes. Power cuts and cripplingly slow internet provide yet more hurdles for Afghan women. The 22-year-old says after years of war in the Taliban, they're used to persevering. I want to continue my studies in online courses and uh, this is my dream, this is my goal, to finish my studying, whatever, what happened in Afghanistan. Miss Sophia, how are you? Her online school, Rumi Academy, went from about 50 mostly female students to more than 500 after the Taliban took over in 2021. It says it had to turn hundreds down. The Taliban still allow online study. But Sophia's teacher, Sana, says there are always security concerns. It's so obvious that uh, if you want to do a cr crucial thing, if you want to take an action that is very important, you have to risk. Uh, and absolutely, uh, we risked everything. Yes, it is uh, risky for us. A growing number of institutes are trying to reach girls and women digitally in their homes. 97% of Afghans are poor so computers and Wi-Fi are out of reach for many. But Sophia believes it's impossible for Afghan women to be kept at home indefinitely. After every sunset, there is sunshine, there is a day. So this is why we must be hopeful and we don't lose our belief, our hopes, and uh, we must be strong in that situation. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu paused his plan to overhaul Israel's judiciary after a day of nationwide turmoil when workers joined a general strike against the proposal and hundreds of thousands of protesters took to the streets. As protests intensified across Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday announced he would delay a decision on a bitterly contested plan to overhaul the judiciary and would seek time for compromise. The move comes as fears rise that Israel's worst national crisis in years could fracture his coalition or escalate into violence. In a televised address, Netanyahu said, where there's an opportunity to avoid civil war through dialogue, I, as prime minister, am taking a time out for dialogue. Opposition parties said they would work to reach an agreement if the government was sincere. Former centrist Prime Minister Yair Lapid said the opposition needed to be sure Netanyahu was not bluffing, but also pointed out in a statement, if the government engages in a real and fair dialogue, we can come out of this moment of crisis stronger and more united, and we can turn this into a defining moment in our ability to live together. Justice Minister Yariv Levin, who's been leading the judicial reform process, said that as a member of Netanyahu, Yahoo's Likud party, he would respect whatever decision the prime minister reached. A situation in which everyone does as they wish is liable to bring about the instant fall of the government and collapse of Likud, he said in a statement. Protesters have flooded Israeli streets for weeks to express their opposition to the plan, which would limit the Supreme Court's powers to rule against the legislature and the executive, while giving coalition lawmakers more power in appointing judges. Netanyahu, himself on trial on corruption, corruption charges, which he denies, has promised to ensure civil rights are protected, but has not backed down from the central thrust of the reforms. His decision Sunday to fire the defense chief for opposing his plans prompted mass overnight protests. Some members of parliament chanted shame, shame, as the government coalition pressed ahead with the plan earlier Monday, while opposition from a labor union grounded flights at Ben Gurion Airport. 
The union said it had called off the strikes after Netanyahu announced the delay, which was praised by leaders in the UK and US governments. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. We welcome uh, this announcement as an opportunity to create additional time and space for compromise. Uh, compromise is precisely what we have been calling for. And we continue to strongly urge Israeli leaders to find a compromise as soon as possible. The crisis is among the worst in Israeli domestic political history and comes amid escalating violence in the West Bank, where more than 250 Palestinian gunmen and civilians and more than 40 Israelis have been killed in the past year. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Now, France braced for another day of strikes and protests, with President Emmanuel Macron remaining defiant over the controversial pensions reforms that have sparked turmoil in the country. Outside the famous Louvre pyramid, the entrance is blocked by the museum's striking staff, who say no one is getting in. And tourists are no exception, much to their frustration. It's ridiculous. We come from around the world with our children to visit a museum, and it's ridiculous that 20 people are blocking the entrance. I can't believe police are not moving them away so they can protest somewhere else. You get the anger, but at the same time, it just sucks for everyone that's visiting this week, right? Tuesday marks the 10th day of national mobilization against President Macron's proposed pension reform, with heavy transport disruption once again expected across the country. For those planning on driving, there may be roadblocks en route. And in Nice, they've already begun. It's just causing trouble for the sake of it at this point. And trade unionists say that they're as motivated as ever. Finding fuel may also be an issue, with 15% of pumps lacking at least one type of petrol. And teachers' unions are doubling down with widespread school closures, with a third of primary school teachers expected to strike. Now, there's been much attention on South Korea-Japan ties since the leaders of the two nations met this month. Against this backdrop, Seoul's envoy to Japan said changes are being detected in Japan, where many are voicing the need for stronger cooperation with Korea for security purposes. Going back to when things were good, this is what South Korea's ambassador to Japan said should be done as quickly as possible. Speaking at a press briefing in Seoul on Monday, the envoy said the recent Seoul-Tokyo summit has become the stepping stone in warming up the two countries' icy relations. He pointed out that an environment is being created in Japan that pushes the Kishida administration to resolve pending issues between Seoul and Tokyo. Those among the right-wing party who place importance on security issues are now strongly arguing that they should cooperate with South Korea. This is evident in Japanese media. Yomiuri Shimbun has been very critical of South Korea, but their tone has changed considerably in the recent months, and they are now emphasizing Seoul-Tokyo cooperation. Yun also stressed that although a direct reference to the Kim Obuchi declaration was missing, the fact that Japan is willing to inherit its essence has restored the bilateral relationship. Despite the prolonged disputes over historical issues, the envoy stressed that South Korea and Japan's strategic interests are almost identical. He added that it is unsound to leave the relationship in an aggravated state, especially when the world faces threats ranging from North Korea to the crisis in Ukraine. The diplomat said another crucial factor in mending ties is resuming people-to-people -people exchanges. We made an effort to make visa-free trips possible between South Korea and Japan. In January alone, around 580,000 Koreans visited Japan, and Japan's most visited country was South Korea. You noted the countries are transitioning to a normalized relationship after spending the past 10 years, as he put it, in a diplomatic war. However, he pointed out that much more needs to be done, as not everything has been resolved through the recent summit. Meanwhile, North Korea is looking to once again roll up its sleeves when it comes to the use of its nuclear weapons program. Leader Kim Jong-un reiterated that the regime must be perfectly ready to use its nuclear weapons when need be. North Korea should be perfectly prepared to use its nuclear weapons anytime and anywhere. That's what North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said on Monday as he was briefed by the regime's Nuclear Weapons Institute on strategies to strengthen its nuclear program. 
The North State-run Korean Central News Agency says Kim called for efforts to further expand the production of weapons-grade nuclear materials in order to exponentially increase its nuclear arsenal. He says it's crucial for the regime's security as a solid nuclear power will protect its people from, quote, enemies. Such a security strategy was not only evident through Kim Jong-un's words, but also through action. In a separate report, the North State media revealed photos showing a firing drill simulating tactical nuclear attacks. On Monday, the regime reportedly detonated a mock nuclear warhead 500 meters above a targeted islet of Kimtek near its Hamgyongbukdo province. This comes as South Korea's military has confirmed that the North fired two short-range ballistic missiles from Chunghua area towards the East Sea during the morning hours of Monday. Meanwhile, the North also said it began another three-day test of a nuclear-capable underwater weapon system on Saturday. It says the Hale one type underwater nuclear attack drone traveled along a 600-kilometer oval-shaped course in the East Sea for 41 hours and 27 minutes, and its test warhead was detonated underwater. But in contrary to the North's claim that the warhead accurately and successfully detonated under the sea, South Korea's Joint Chief of Staff says such claims seem to be exaggerated and manipulated adding that the regime's underwater weapons capabilities are still seen to be in the developing phase. Now moving on to science and technology, the chat GPT phenomenon continues following the release of the newly improved GPT-4 two weeks ago. But what about the side effects? Two weeks ago, California startup OpenAI released the latest version of its AI chatbot GPT-4 to the public. ChatGPT created quite a stir when it first launched in November last year as it wrote drama scripts and poems and even managed to pass the bar exam. And GPT-4 is even better. It can process eight times more words at once than its predecessor and vastly improved its bar exam score. As GPT-4 continued to make headlines, an issue emerged, the problem of hacking. GPT-4 can competently highlight a weakness in a program if asked the right questions, meaning hackers could use those flaws to get into whichever system they're targeting. But experts say it's not a surprise. This kind of problem has been existent for many, many years. Um, for example, uh, let's think about spams email spams. Um, spammers come up with new techniques to bypass spam filters, right, every day. And um, spam filters catch up with uh, these new techniques every day. So it's like arms race, right? Defenders also can use these AI models to improve their defending technique, I think. Professor Kim said there are other problems to discuss. For example, since these AI chatbots can create text indefinitely with a simple task, finding accurate information could become a challenge in the future in the sea of randomly generated information. And if the data that these AI chatbots learn from has any type of prejudices to begin with, it will have a negative impact on society. However, even with these future challenges, experts said GPT-4 has a significant meaning to society. Professor Powell added that despite the potential risks, he thinks AI researchers are heading in the right direction. The Duke of Sussex unexpectedly appeared at the High Court as legal proceedings began over alleged phone tapping and other breaches of privacy. Prince Harry, who is one of those suing Associated Newspapers, the publisher of the Daily Mail, was joined in the courtroom by singer Sir Elton John. Britain's Prince Harry and singer Elton John made a surprise appearance at London's High Court on Monday as they and several others began a lawsuit against the publisher of the Daily Mail newspaper over years of alleged phone tapping and privacy breaches. The high-profile celebrities as well as actors Elizabeth Hurley and Sadie Frost brought a lawsuit against Associated Newspapers or ANL alleging they were victims of, quote, numerous unlawful acts, including hacking mobile phone messages, bugging calls, and even breaking into private property. ANL, which is seeking to have the case thrown out, said in a statement it categorically denied the allegations and would vigorously defend them if necessary. A spokesperson for Prince Harry, who flew in from California, said he wanted to be there to show his support, in his claim, Harry accuses ANL of seeking information about private flight details of his ex-girlfriend, Chelsea Davey, 
and hacked mobile phone voicemail messages and bugged the landlines of his friends. The claim said the unlawful attempts to find out details of the royal's private travel plans were a significant security risk and, quote, dangerous. In court submissions, ANL said the claims were based on inference rather than evidence and that there was little or no evidence of unlawful information gathering by its journalists, which it strongly denies. Media intrusion was one of the reasons Harry and Meghan cited for stepping back from royal duties and moving to California to start new lives. Welcome back now for more news. Let's take you around the world in a minute. A group of fans of pop singer Taylor Swift rallied outside a Los Angeles courthouse as a hearing for their lawsuit against Ticketmaster and Live Nation took place. They accused the company of overcharging fans after a 2010 merger. Three nine-year-old children and three adults were killed in a shooting at the Covenant School, a private Christian elementary school in Nashville, Tennessee. The shooter, a 28-year-old Nashville resident, police say was once a student at the school, was killed during gunfire with police. Peruvian authorities said they seized 2.3 tons of cocaine disguised as ceramic tiles destined for Turkey via a growing maritime route for illicit drugs. The drug bust happened at a warehouse at Peru's biggest port, El Calao, just outside the capital, Lima. U.S. aircraft carrier USS Nimitz arrived in South Korea's southern harbor city, Busan, the first time it docked in the country in nearly six years, partly to mark the 70th anniversary of the alliance. Air quality in northern Thailand climbed to hazardous levels as a result of seasonal agricultural burning across and in the region. Local media reported that 4,115 hotspots were detected in the northern Thailand in the past 24 hours. Some parts of Twitter's source code have been leaked in the social media platform owned by billionaire Elon Musk is seeking information on the person responsible. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. Now, in case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. And finally, we leave you tonight with a French speed flyer, Valentin Deluc, soaring through iconic sites of Cappadocia in Turkey. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.